His was the only boat to arrive. I think maybe it was a cow. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> There's a thank you letter from Lyndon Johnson. There was even a monorail at one point to the east of us. Plus, everybody forgets about pirates. This is the coolest field trip I have ever been on. I don't know, but I've been told keep on dance for never get old. Hello and welcome to the Long Island History Project, a podcast that brings you stories and interviews with people passionate about Long Island history. You can hear them all at longislandhistoryproject.org. My name is Chris Kretz. I'm your host, and our opening music is courtesy of the Homegrown String Band. How do you solve a problem like Robert Moses? Well, not solve exactly, but teach How do you teach New York or Long Island history when you come to this guy? Well, luckily, it's infrastructure week on the podcast, so we are talking bridges and buses and beaches. But most of all, the two big bobs of Long Island history, Robert Moses and Robert Caro, with today's two very special guests. My name is Kara Schlichting, and I am an associate professor in the history department at Queens College, which is a campus of the City University of New York system. And I am an urban and environmental historian. And my first book is about the rise of regional planning and environmental change in greater New York, particularly the Bronx and Queens in the late 19th and early 20th century. And it's called New York Recentered, Building the Metropolis from the Shore. I'm Katie Yuva, and I'm an adjunct lecturer at CUNY Baruch, and uh, also a public historian. I've worked in museums for several years. I'm currently in curriculum development at the New York Public Library, and uh, a lot of my research focuses on New York City, Queens, and uh, the New York World's Fairs. Great, and and thank you both. We'll say we're on Zencaster together tonight. Thank you for spending a, a Tuesday night talking about Robert Moses. To some, it might sound like a, a hard night, but I think for all of us, it's a time well spent. <laughs> yes, indeed. It's our pleasure. And I, I became aware of you two, a couple of interesting things. Uh, we we can reference a two-part essay you, you both co-authored in New York History Journal on teaching Robert Moses. And I was just recently interviewing a, a gentleman who lives on Gilgo Beach, and kind of we brought up Moses in, in the context of him building a road through the old Gilgo Beach and... To my surprise, somewhat, he he championed Moses about you know how he had kind of saved the area. So it it kind of was serendipitous that I found your article at the same time to think of reevaluating Robert Moses. And you know, I grew up in Queens, so I, I've lived with a certain view of him just from from osmosis. I think. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about where is Robert Moses? You're, you're both teachers. Where do you place him, broadly speaking, in in New York history? Oh, man, that's the million-dollar question, Chris. Where do we place Robert Moses? <laughs> or, or where does he stand now? I guess what's, what's sort of the accepted This view? is a conversation Katie and I have been having for a year and a half, and I'm not sure we're done yet, but I think it's a really important one. Um, we came to this project to co-author this two-part essay about teaching Robert Moses because we were both grappling with Robert Moses in the classroom. And we are grappling with Robert Moses ourselves, but our students didn't necessarily have the same baggage that we were bringing. For myself, what that meant is that my first book looks at progressive era New York City and park development. So I spent a lot of time in Robert Moses' papers at the New York Public Library. And then I read a lot of the published reports from his various agencies and uh, parks departments. And I had been surprised about the story of pre-World War II Robert Moses, and it didn't necessarily align with the popular culture story of Robert Moses that I had uh, learned growing up in greater New York City uh, in you know the turn of the 21st century. And so Katie and I had been talking about how to square the myth of Moses and the long shadow of the power broker with our students who are really 21st century New Yorkers who don't maybe have the baggage of 70s, 80s, 90s New York, and who haven't heard about Robert Moses as much as maybe um, the generation before. And we wanted to do this by thinking about specifics and specific projects that we could ground a physicality in the way we talk to our students, both in spaces in the city that they could think about the physicality of, but also um, in physical materials and archival materials, to not talk about myth so much, but as historians, talk about primary sources and the narratives that we saw in the archives and ask our students if they saw the same stories. 
I'll say for myself, um, I taught, I've taught New York City history specifically for a couple of different semesters and at different schools. And I would say my students tend to be split among, there are certainly students who are not familiar with Robert Moses or haven't heard of him, but of the students who have uh, universally strong negative feelings about him, especially my students from the Bronx, like they are aware of the Cross Bronx Expressway as a Mm -hmm. Robert Moses project and as something people tend to be negative about and critical about. So for me, you know, some of it was about challenging or unpacking those assumptions. And some of it was, is about um, just grounding those assumptions in historical sources and also trying to pull uh, the Robert Moses story and people's interpretations of Robert Moses forward and to use Robert Moses also to ask questions about the present. Because one thing that's pretty universal to my students is a concern about gentrification and a concern about redevelopment, but I also had students who were really enthusiastic about urban planning and new projects. So uh, trying to kind of weave past and present together uh, has been a a major part of my teaching experience. So let's talk a little bit then about, I guess it's not really the elephant in the room, but (laughs) one of the, one of the lines you mentioned in in your essay, you talk about the limitations of the power broker narrative. And we'll just say that when we say the power broker, we mean Robert Caro's biography, uh, came out in 1974. Uh, what I love, I think you, you mentioned how during the pandemic, it, it was like the book that you saw most often on people's <laughs> bookshelves behind them in Zoom meetings. <laughs> so what, what can you say about the impact of that book? And Carol was a former Newsday reporter, so he was a journalist. He still is. <laughs> um, he's still writing. So what what kind of impact then and, and, and on the historical record would you both say Carol's book had? on Moses? <laughs> I would say overwhelming impact. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was something that uh, we joked about uh, during the pandemic, but it really was the case, you know, anytime you turned on New York One, anyone who was being interviewed on New York One had pow- had the power broker prominently featured in the background, be they journalists, politicians, historians, urban planners, anybody. It was, it's a sign of authority, uh, it's also something that people talk about a lot on Twitter. People invoke on Twitter a lot, and at least in my corner of Twitter. And it is the book that students are familiar with as well. And I think it's a combination of – it is not the only thing in the historiography, and that is something that Kara and I have both emphasized a lot, but it really dominates in terms of laying down a very sharp perspective on Robert Moses and being a book that subsequent books – are written either to agree with or to refute, but it casts a long shadow, absolutely. And I think, you know, there's no denying it's a really engaging book and it's very compelling. And, uh, you know, we even in our article, which challenges it in some ways, we recommend using it too, but we recommend historicizing it. We do question some of its findings. And I personally just feel sort of wary of the idea of putting a, ton of emphasis on a single, you know, great man of history, or in this in this case, bad man of history. There's a lot of emphasis on this one figure and all of his influence. Um, and I I also balk a little at the idea of unseating a historical figure with a, like a present day great man. <laughs> you know, people tend to put Robert Caro in that position as the sort of this these two dueling personalities, these two major figures and people are always emphasizing the heft and the length of the power broker. And so you, things like that give me pause. And as, as historians, I think we're both drawn to reading a lot of different things and layering different points of view on each other and bouncing things off of each other. So it's very drive and magisterialness uh, is something that I, I, for with me as as a historian doesn't sit well. Yeah. Carrie, your thoughts on, on the power broker. I think as Katie says very well, that this is a fascinating window into mid-1970s New York. But there are two things about that, that scholars have been writing about New York and Robert Moses continually since then. I'm one of them. Katie's one of them. But there are so many scholars who are asking new questions of sources across the decades. And the moment in history in which you write – 
inevitably shapes the questions you ask of the, of the historical record. And we know that Caro was asking specific questions about the fall of New York in mid 70s New York. But a historian who's writing in you know, 2010, for example, lives in a profoundly changed city. And thus they ask new questions and might find new narratives in the same archival materials. That's what makes, to me, history such a vibrant field, is that historiography allows us to always reassess and bring fresh eyes. And not just, you know, historians like Katie and I, but our students who are practicing historians, even if it's only for 20 months or 20, uh, 20 weeks, rather, in a fall or spring semester. And so I am always asking my students to not take anything for granted just because it was printed in a, in a book and that we should, should always reassess. And I, Katie and I have talked about this is that one challenge in teaching Moses or even talking to like your neighbor or your friend's aunt or uncle about Moses is that so much of the power broker naturalizes the story of Moses, that that is the only story we have for kind of the starting point of our conversation. And it's a good starting point, but it can't be the only one. And so we want to ask our students to understand how to reassess history across time and hopefully feel empowered to ask and answer their own questions about Moses. So if, if to jump off of that, if you're from the research you've done and the sources you've looked at, what, what other stories are hiding in between Caro's story or, or are being blocked out? You know, the, the shadow of Caro is his, what stories are laying under those shadows that you would want to highlight maybe? In our piece that Katie and I put together, we pitched three case studies that look at public spaces as a way to start to take small steps to look behind that shadow or around that shadow, as you say. And we did this for a reason. It was really hard to pick these case studies, but we wanted to show the breadth of works that Moses is involved in, not just the most famous ones. We wanted to show change over time in his career because he is in power for so long, the type of work he oversees, the funding he has to oversee it, where in the metropolitan area he has influenced that all changes over time. So one of the case studies that Katie and I find really compelling are Long Island parks and the rise of regional recreation on Long Island in the 1920s, which is where Moses has um, kind of his first big foray into public works influence through the Long Island State Park Commission. Um, to me, I think the most important thing that I feel the power broker gets in the way of maybe is historicizing or contextualizing Robert Moses, because it's a very, what makes it compelling is that it's such a character driven story. It's about this one man and his ambitions and his rise and fall. But to me as a New York City historian, I think it's really important to put him in context of, you know, where do his ideas come from? How is he fueled by ideas about good government and city planning and the progressive era, um, the crying need for real change and major urban projects in the 1930s? You know, public opinion soured on some of those things later or how they played out later. But to me, the, the intentions originally makes sense. And, and uh, you know, that's worth exploring further. And even if we are, you know, wanting to be critical of Robert Moses, to put that criticism in context, too, that, uh, you know, he had widespread support from many government officials, funded heavily by the federal government. And there was a Robert Moses-esque figure in most major American cities, so that this is not solely, um, it's not a one-man story. Right. But I guess, would would you both agree that the the man that he was, whether he was taking advantage of the times and was able to manipulate or, or capitalize on positions, someone else in that position arguably or obviously would have done it differently? Or, or what, what what is the scenario? I, you know, I, I think Kenneth Jackson in one, in one of his books says, without Robert Moses, the modern New York City would not have been possible. So if you, if you did a wonderful, it's a wonderful life version where there was no Robert Moses porn, would some type of development like this have happened, but not maybe as heavy handed or whatever adverb you want to use, you know, would, would roads still have been built and maybe not as destructively or making, taking routes, you know, was he inevitable or, or would some type of similar building out of the city infrastructure have happened? And, you know, what we got was the way that Moses wanted to do it. I think his particular intervention in my mind is number one, his longevity. Um, the fact that he was working in urban planning and in building 
uh, for more than 50 years. Um, that's pretty unique. And, uh, you know, many people have pointed out this as both something that's very impressive about him and something that's somewhat sinister about him is his ability to hold overlapping offices that pertain to different regions of New York and also his ability to uh, direct funding streams into his own coffers. So that made, uh, made him extra productive. So I think if there weren't a Robert Moses, you might have somebody who had his early career, somebody who was on the Long Island State Parks Commission, and you would probably have a different person who built some, but maybe not all of those bridges in New York City. And you might have a different person who built Lincoln Center. So the, the idea of those projects being diffuse, uh, probably fewer things would have been built. And then, you know, we, I, I, yeah, that is an interesting question. I wonder what wouldn't have been built without him. I would add to this, um, is that Robert Moses is not a designer. He's not a landscape architect. He's not an architect. He's not a city planner. He is a marshaller of plans and a marshaller of funding. And so when you look at the designs that Moses gets to oversee their construction, Jones Beach to Lincoln Center, right, to Split Rock Golf Course in the Bronx, these are all ideas that are percolating in the early 20th century amongst the first generation of professional landscape architects and landscape engineers, right? The Bronx River Parkway is a pre-Moses project. It's the first modern parkway in the United States. It's built in the teens and finished in the early 20s by the Westchester County Park Commission, which is very influential to what Moses then wants to do on Long Island. And he's very explicit in that, in his writing, that he wants to transpose the success of the Bronx River Parkway and then Westchester's coming parkway network to Long Island. And so he is not the designer. These designs are in the air and he pushes them forward. And I think that's really important. He is of a cohort, and I write about this in my book, of ideas that really start in the 1880s in what becomes the Bronx and then come to fruition across the turn of the century through different park planning at city, county, and state levels in New York. So it's just a good example of how he is a big figure in the history, but he's never a, a person alone in the room. There's always a cohort. So I, I want to bring it to Kerry. You started to talk about his early career in the parks on Long Island. And this is a, a side theme or, or sub theme I'm, I wanted to ask both of you. So you're historians of urban spaces or of, of New York City. And the story of Moses is tied to the development of New York, yet he, he made his name, arguably, on Long Island. And I'm curious, how do you see that? So it, technically not urban, do you, how do you see the Long Island space, and I guess we'll say Nassau and Suffolk, um, as part of the story? I mean, was it just open? Because the way he talks about it and the way he acted, it was basically a space for New York City to come out and recreate and, and enjoy. So, you know, it was sort of, t to him, undiscovered country that could be run over how how he could how do you how do you fit long island as an entity those two counties into your studies and and the the bigger picture of having them be adjacent to new york city history but its own place so my first book asks just this question that you're asking so i am fascinated by it and i promise i won't make us talk about it for 30 days um, because i spent 9 years with it but i would argue i'll have that, you back <laughs> <laughs> i would argue that new york city's metropolitan growth the vision that New York is more than just an urban core starts in the 18, 1860s, 1870s. And across the turn of the century, across consolidation of the five borough city in 1898, across the rise of regional suburban networks, um, Moses is not the only person. In fact, it's pretty common conversation among New York City government officials and state officials that it is going to be inevitable that the suburban ring of New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, and Long Island will be incorporated in some way into our metropolitan system. The question is, what will that look like? And of course, the regional plan of New York and its environs from the Russell Sage Foundation in the 1920s is the culmination of all these different scales of thinking from zoning to infrastructure, to trains, to parks. And, um, Long Island seems to be really well positioned to those regional thinkers because it doesn't have any heavy industry. So there's not competition for land use on heavy industry. And it is rather undeveloped in terms of suburbanization. In part, that's because it's so difficult to get across. It hasn't modernized its public in, uh, transit infrastructure yet. 
it's behind New Jersey and New York and the state of Connecticut. And so it looks like it's it's lying in wait almost. It's how the park reformers in the 1920s talk about it. And from the very beginning, Long Island State Park Commission understands that. In fact, Al Smith is governor and he's a great proponent of the park system for greater New York. And they announced the Long Island State Park Commission during a heat wave during the summer of um, 1925. And they know that it's going to be useful to them that it's really hot in New York City. And they say it in the address. Look how hot you are in New York. Why shouldn't you have access to beautiful beaches and modern parkways on Long Island? It's literally part of New York's kind of hinterland and it should be made accessible to New Yorkers. You can imagine if you put yourself in a hot day in this part of the country in July, if someone got on the radio and said, I'm going to build you a beautiful park to swim in and you lived, you know, in downtown Brooklyn or you know, Upper West Side, that would sound pretty darn good. So from the very beginning, they have metropolitan scaled visions of what Long Island will be and its future is tied to New York City. And and there was really no countervailing entity on Long Island that could have Push. I mean, the the wealthy interest, I guess you could say, tried to push back, but there was there was no coherent planning going on east of Queens that could have promoted a different vision, right? So there was really nothing to stop that being fulfilled, that kind of vision of Long Island as the hinterland of the city. That um, north shore of Nassau County, the Gold Coast fights back, and they are to some extent successful in terms of the way they organize their municipal governments and they hire landscape architects to fight against these plans, but not to the extent that they can bar our, our regional vision of Long Island State Park Commission. Katie, what do you think? <laughs> I concur. <laughs> no, I, uh, yes, I, I do agree with that as assessment. I, I was basically going to say just that uh, I feel that Robert Moses really caught a zeitgeist there. Um, despite, you know, he has a long history of hostility with the Regional Plan Association and, mm -hmm. and they with him. But also, they are kind of aligned in their vision or their understanding of New York City itself being a sort of central node that pulls people in and also needs to distribute them outwards. I mean, that that's a prevailing vision, uh, even among people who disagree with each other uh, about how to go about that. But that's a prevailing vision in New York from the 19 teens, solidified by the regional plan and all the way into now, basically. And there is money to be made. The real estate yeah, well, that's true. I know. very and, and, well. Right. And, and the, right, the opportunities for the Nassau Suffolk politicians, I guess, to capitalize it, it fit in with some of their planning but to just to stick with that earlier period so just to run through some of the things you know uh hexer state park which is an islip he he develops jones beach in 1929 and the parkway is running to that and northern state parkway so the these are early successes you would say right in terms of building up maybe goodwill or if moses did not have this early history of championing parks and and opening them up for the city dwellers would he have gotten as far as he did? Was that sort of capital that he could use going forward? Um, I think it definitely was. And it, it demonstrated, um, you know, he, this was a partnership with the state government. He won the favor of Al Smith. Uh, it, it it showed, uh, you know, it's a very, it's a regional focus, but it's funding and planning that goes across a, a couple of different jurisdictions. And yeah, he had a really well-established track record. And with Jones Beach, you know, he did get into conflicts with local landowners, but the sort of prevailing story that came out of that and most of the press coverage was Robert Moses, champion of the people. At, at that time, Jones Beach made his reputation as a really talented, gifted builder of, of recreational spaces and at that time, champion of the people. And I think that was something that was very attractive to New Deal era New York. And that, that's one of your case studies, as you mentioned. So that that was really an innovative project. So do you think that that luster has kind of worn off him or do you think he still gets the credit that he should get for establishing Jones Beach? I think that Jones Beach is most impressive. I guess, I mean, it's hard not to be impressed by the water tower and the scale of it. But it's even more impressive to me as a historian when I see that it's not a one-off, that it becomes a pattern from Jacob Reese Beach to um, Orchard Beach to Astoria, 
pool, those are all coming out of the 1930s New York City park system that Moses is in charge of overseas. And it's not that one high caliber park space is built, but that there are dozens built in the 1920s and 1930s. And so that to me, the recreation, the pre-World War II recreational infrastructure that Moses helps usher through is really a modernizing feature that it's hard for, you know, New Yorkers who are just so used to these spaces these days to appreciate that there were no large parks in these corners of the outer boroughs, the Bronx head parks, I should say. But for Queens, for Nassau County, it transforms where you can be outside in public. And so he is celebrated in the 30s. And we have some primary sources that we offer to uh, access for uh, instructors if they would want to teach this. And we have photographs that are all publicly accessible and digitized or great digital archives in the state archives in Albany and then in the New York Public Library to get a sense of how beautiful some of these spaces are. Even in the Great Depression, Lewis Mumford, who doesn't have much good thing, many good things to say about <laughs> Robert Moses, has to admit that no spot is too small or too mean for a little bit of beauty, even in a cash-strapped depression. I think in terms of that question of his uh, his reputation or the, the sort of luster of his career, I think that one reason we included Jones Beach is that it does establish his career. And it also, to me, is emblematic of one side of the often Janice-faced public impression of Robert Moses. So um, there is, I mean, I would say now, to me, the prevalent uh, feeling towards him that I see is hostility and criticism. But to the extent that the public is still ambivalent about Robert Moses, that ambivalence is split between his 1920s and 1930s recreational facilities and his post-war highways and um, especially the highways. Um, but I also think in in my personal experience, I've seen pretty significant regional disparities with people on Long Island more likely to feel positively about Robert Moses because they heavily associate him with great parks and with reasonable highways, whereas people in New York City associate him more heavily with, with racism, with displacement, and with worse highways. That's that's an oversimplification, but it is something that I've come across. And even Jones Beach isn't free of this conversation because of Cairo's, perhaps one of Cairo's most infamous claims about highway heights and bus access to Jones Beach. And historians have gone back and forth and looked and not the historians are not in total agreement about whether or not the bus the buses were purposely excluded from parkways. But there was a great 2021 Washington Post fact checker article about this recently, which we um, really encourage to use with students in the classroom. It reminds us that history is never settled. But even the celebrated Jones Beach is not totally free of this conversation. It's inherent to the Moses discussion. Right. And, and that legend is that he, he built the bridges or had them design the bridges to be low enough that city buses could not pass under them. Right. Mm -hmm. is that, Correct. That's the claim. Basically. Yeah. And so you, that up for there's there's no smoking gun or, or document that has established that beyond doubt. There's a couple of different issues with it. Uh, there's there's no question that the bridges are low and have low clearances. The question is whether that was a deliberate strategy to keep people from okay. taking public transit from the city. Um, and there's a couple of, a, a few things I can sort of name briefly uh, about people's interventions in this conversation. Um, one thing about it, which I, I think is especially interesting because it is kind of intrinsic to a lot of the power broker and is really open to interpretation. A lot of that kind of evidence about the low bridges, there's another claim in the book that Robert Moses kept pool water cold because he believed it would deter black people from swimming in public pools. Those claims are untraceable. Um, they come from interviews with specific people, and he names those people, but we don't have transcripts of those interviews. We don't have recordings, and it's not written down anywhere. Um, these are sort of conversations that he had. Um, so simultaneously, as a historian, it's frustrating because you want to go back to that source and you want to prove it or see it with your own eyes. On the other hand, it's true that those kinds of deliberate acts of racism are exactly the kind of things people don't 
put down and make a carbon copy of and put in their folder. So it doesn't necessarily invalidate it, but it does open it to questions. Um, there was a, a historian, Thomas Campanella, made some measurements of the bridges and found that they were lower than comparable contemporary bridges in Westchester. But there has also been, there's been questioning of that. I mean, there's there's no question that the parkways were made for non-commercial traffic, so not buses and not trucks. Um, but on the other hand, it's it's also not totally true that you can't get to Jones Beach on a bus. Like even today, you, you could take the train to Freeport and get a bus from there. Like there are there are roads that go to the beach that allow buses, but not all of them. So it, it is a somewhat ambiguous question. So in a somewhat bigger context of that, and I think, Kyra, you're talking about, or I think, Katie, you were mentioning about the different perceptions depending on, you know, the city view of him. So in terms of teaching him, how how do you handle the the obvious impact he had on different social groups? And we can talk about East Tremont and, and building the Cross Bronx through existing neighborhoods. And so, I mean, is, is that part of the reevaluation or the nuance? How, how do you bring nuance to, to that discussion, um, the, the social impact he had? Yeah, I mean, I I'll, I'll say one thing as a, you know, as a teacher, and also uh, as a white teacher in a predominantly non-white school, I and especially in teaching local history, um, most of the history I teach, you know, personal memory is a really significant component of it, and also you know, what you call your positionality, like what's my experience of Robert Moses projects? What's your experience of Robert Moses projects? If you're, if your family's been here for a while, like what do people in your family say about him? Like all of those things are important and they're evidence and they matter. And so I would say my top priority is never to invalidate anything a student says in class. That's number one. If I, I think something that comes up a lot is like, you know, if a student in my class has heard about and is very critical of the Cross Bronx Expressway, I would just add in, you know, a different part of his career that they may not know about. Not to unseat, not to say you're wrong, because I don't think they're wrong, but just to say, like, this is a man whose career shifted dramatically. And, you know, why why did he wind up, in, you know, in the 50s and 60s building highways that displaced so many people? How is that different than in building smaller parkways in the 1920s in a less populated area? Um, Where was the mandate coming from for these things? I I think another part of it is just understanding that um, there's a good book about this that's a little bit harder to find these days because it's older, but called The New York Approach um, by Joel Schwartz, which is about the fact that most elected officials, borough presidents, uh, you know, people in charge in the city were aligned with Robert Moses. They didn't de- they didn't necessarily like his personality, but there was a consensus view. And so in, in some ways that actually further validates criticism that my, my students often have. But to understand, like, you know, that says more about the democratic process. It's, you know, people point to Robert Moses as somebody who was never elected, but did all these things. But it wasn't only him exerting this will. It's there are a lot of elected officials behind him who approve his projects or who he's working in concert with. So in some ways, it's actually about substantiating people's claims. I think Katie and I both have talked about this with each other, is that how change over time is so important to Moses's career. And it really, uh, engagement with Moses's legacy really benefits from revisiting him more than once. You, if you're teaching, you know, if you're casually interested in New York City history, you've got 400 years of it, you might be inclined to just say, oh, one day on Robert Moses, then we'll move forward. But that change over time matters and context matters, which is something we're trying to teach constantly because taking a history class is a practice in critical thinking, right? And so um, that change over time really matters. And we in the art- second half of the article have case studies that come from three different mo- moments in his career, one from the Long Island State Park Commission years, one from New Deal, Triborough Bridge Authority power, and one from post-war slum clearance projects at Lincoln Center to show just how the tone and tenor of the physicality, like the spaces of the projects change, but how they influence communities. It's, it's very different. The way Lincoln Center shaped the people who lived in San Juan Hill and Lincoln Square is profoundly different than the way that Jones Beach shaped residents of Nassau County or of Queens. And so we try to show change over time. We try to try to show 
multiple cases. And I think my goal personally is to make students say, huh, it's more complicated. Maybe it isn't just Robert Moses as villain. Maybe it's just more complicated because of the dynamics of a beautiful public space versus the harm slum clearance does. Like, How do we square those? Something else that I think is interesting, along with the change over time, like we emphasize in our article that the nature of his projects changed over time and his goals and priorities changed over time. But something that is sometimes less explored, but I've certainly experienced a lot in my own life, is the way a single project of his changes over time. Mm -hmm. So the two examples that really stick out to me um, is Jones Beach for for one thing, and and this is another positionality thing. Um, you know, my own personal history. Both sides of my grandparents uh, grew up in Brownsville, in the sort of you know poor section of Brooklyn. They were poor first generation Americans, and they were the population who was shut out from Jones Beach in the early 1930s. And my grandfathers uh, talked to me about that. I asked, I interviewed them once. And ask them, you know, where did you go to the beach as a kid? Or like, what did you do for fun as a kid? And they went to Coney Island because that's where you could get on a subway. And they specifically, both of them said, you know, we couldn't go to Jones Beach. We didn't have a car. And my family is one of many white ethnic families who benefited from the post-World War II suburban boom. Uh, My grandparents were able to buy houses. They lived in Nassau County. Their children, my parents, grew up going to Jones Beach all the time. And then consequently, I grew up going to Jones Beach every week. So in a sense, other bigger economic changes simultaneously democratized Jones Beach. People who couldn't have gone there a generation, like 20 years before, went there all the time. And also solidified the racism of Jones Beach so that, you know, increasingly the reason there were not a lot of black people at Jones Beach is because there were so few black people who were able to live in Nassau County. So there's the the redlining aspect of it. And that's outside of Robert Moses' purview. Conversely, um, Flushing Meadow Park is something that was famously first a marsh and then famously for several decades, a, a dump, an ash heap, and was a very difficult project to build, but ultimately was converted into a park. And now is one of the most diverse places in the city and is a really thriving public space, um, I think really beyond what anyone could have imagined when it first started being converted into a park in the 1930s. So, you know, there are systemic factors that shape who's going to be in these places, but it's also true that the public makes these spaces their own. So what... It, um... I'm I'm just trying, and I'm not a trained historian, so I'm I'm trying to balance. And, and I, I've probably read too much of Caro in in preparation for, for this interview. <laughs> although I did read a lot of the other articles that I could find. The the personal man. How much do you have to leave that aside, or in your work as historians, do you try not to judge based on the personal stories, the ones that could be corroborated? You know, and and just from his interviews, I mean, there is. And, and he's a prickly, a prickly guy, guy <laughs> which not that he was a, an abuser, but, you know, in terms of being a bad, a bad boss, maybe, or bad, you know, choking people in meetings, if you believe some of those stories. So I, I guess, where do you place that kind of behavior in, in your role as historians balancing or, or trying to bring, uh, looking at it through different lenses? Is that sort of, do you have to leave that behind in a way or, or disassociate yourself from the kind of personal feelings he may, he may bring up in people? That is always going to be part of the conversation, really. People always are going to have opinions about Moses. And at least for me as a historian, I think he sounds like a nightmare of a colleague, right? Happy I didn't have to work with him. Doesn't sound like somebody who's, you know, collaborative in the way that like working with Katie is great. But two things that are... (laughs) You don't see me as a Robert Moses figure. (laughs) You're open to critique, Katie. Um, So... In the pure like crassness of teaching in the classroom, spicy Robert Moses primary sources get my students. My students are kind of gobsmacked that anyone was he's saying these kind of things. You know, he seems really human. He seems maybe unpleasant, definitely unpleasant actually, but he seems really human in the classroom. That can be useful. I have a primary source from the New York Public Library I showed to my students where he basically says, this guy's an idiot. Write back to him. Tell him how stupid he is. I can't believe anybody would even waste my time. And I put it up and we kind of we talk about like what it would be like to have to to work with someone like that and what it would be like to have to deal with all the kind of the strictures of Jones Beach, right? That Robert Moses is very clear that he only likes certain types of behavior and certain types of crowds. And 
um, like who the parks are relevant for and who feels welcome in spaces that Moses built? Like that's a question I can ask my students in 2022, or we could have asked them a hundred years about people in the past a hundred years ago. So I think having someone with these like hot takes helps engage students and say, do the ends justify the means? Does the beauty of Jones Beach justify someone being jerky about certain types of behavior? Someone who, who tells you that you, you have no class because you like the Penny Arcade at Coney Island. Like that would hurt if you loved Coney Island's boardwalk, that would make you feel bad. But that conversation I think is really useful in class, particularly in this moment, when infrastructure history is sometimes a hard sell, right? That the Tribro Bridge Authority's financing isn't exactly a razzle dazzle for an undergraduate, but it's important. <laughs> and <laughs> having having like real life people you can bring into stories of massive infrastructural change in the 1920s and 1930s, whether it's pictures of people having a really good time at Jones Beach or dancing or swimming or these snippets of Moses's temper. Both are useful in the classroom as long as we give you give it time to breathe and ask people, what do they think? I think he is an undeniably an unpleasant person and is, you know, not somebody, yeah, not somebody I'd want to hang out with. I, I do sometimes I <laughs> I I I relish the thought of well, you know, what what a Robert Moses would be like in the age of Twitter. Because he he's like that. Like his sound bites are like that. He calls his critics, you know, professional vomiters and mudslingers. I mean, he has a lot of really intense, hostile turns of phrase. So uh, there, that's not to me. It's it's not really debatable. And also, I would say just in general, as a teacher slash public historian slash somebody who's given a lot of museum tours, I I'm not disposed this way, and I just feel like you're never going to get anywhere saying to somebody hey, your deeply held feeling about this is wrong. You know, when somebody comes up to you and says like, Robert Moses was a nasty guy, my approach is always like, yes, and, you know, yes, and is it possible that some of his projects have merit? Yes, and who else enabled the things about his career that were worst? And I would say as another counter, you know, bringing it back to kind of contemporary issues, you know, the reason people feel so strongly about him is that he's, he has an ongoing relevance, not only in terms of the actual projects, but in terms of the idea of, you know, how top down should planning be? How large scale should projects be? Where does the public voice belong mm. in contemporary debates about development? And he hits a nerve because there are so many unresolved issues about this. But I would also say, don't be fooled by a developer or a planner who says things nicely, I would say, you know, that's, that's our, that's our 21st century problem of sometimes, you know, people propose things that are quite harmful, or at least have a lot of potential for harm, but they have learned the Robert Moses lesson and, you know, say, this is going to be amazing for the community. We're going to create so many jobs. And, you know, sometimes that's true, or it's at least debatable, but nobody goes to a community board meeting anymore and is like, I'm going to break you. You're all a bunch of eggs. I'm going to break to make an omelet, <laughs> to paraphrase. Um, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't question their projects the same. I, I don't want to keep us much longer, so I just have a few stray things. But he, So he died in 1981. And it, so he's still within living memory for some. And obviously, Caro's book is still looming large. Do, do you think over time, the way he's treated by history will change? I mean, I'm asking you to look forward, I guess. But knowing how history goes and historiography works, would, would you anticipate more shifts in his standing or study? I would say that, you know, our articles sort of trace a pendulum swing in that in the 1920s, 30s, and into the 40s, he was a popular public figure and was generally seen as a hero. His reputation uh, started to decline in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and the power broker solidified that. There was uh, some revision and challenging of that in the 2000s, and we sort of embrace a lot of that school of thought, um, the Kenneth Jackson take, um, or there's a multi-author book, Robert Moses and the Modern City, that mm -hmm. uh, I largely agree with. Um, I would say the, the atmosphere right now pushes back on that and is, I would say, 85 to 90% heavily critical of him. And I would like to say, I hope there will be some evening out in the future where people 
there's there's no need to deny his racism or the racist harm that many of his projects did. But I would hope that simultaneously we can distribute the blame more evenly and point out other ways and other people's racism that was shaping cities in this time period and not have it all live in this one man as a vessel for widespread racism. That's one thing. And I also hope we won't lose sight of the importance of large, ambitious, robustly funded public projects. But right now, I do think things are trending in a a pretty anti-Robert Moses way. So I'll be curious about what happens in the coming years. And Kara, do you have any thoughts on on that too? Where you see the study of Moses going, or his, you know, the next phase of his evaluation? Well, I think that lingering fascination with Moses reminds us that people like to have a singular figure to you know pin success or failure on, and that I would love to see and this you know comes out of there's lots of great scholars doing, you know, Peter Le Facial's book on the South Bronx um, is a great like new book thinking about community that continues to persist even when a project comes through. And that even if a neighborhood is harmed by urban renewal, it doesn't mean that those people stop being a neighborhood and a community and doesn't mean that people don't continue to fight for the places that matter to them and to try to rebuild and to find new moments in the city. And I think that we could look at that in the past or the present. We offer an example about how the community of San Juan Hill continues to push for the city to see it as a community. It's largely Puerto Rican to push to be seen as a community that matters, even with Lincoln Center being built. And I think that we could learn from that to always, you know, just because um, a large scale plan comes through doesn't mean that there isn't always a social history to be found if you're willing to like look for the regular folks who are always going to um, be there with a a maybe slightly different narrative of what a city can be and should be. I had two quick questions or a question for each of you to answer quickly, if you don't mind. It's Mm -hmm. sort of a a palate cleanser in in a way, but it uh, (laughs) gets back to process and and the love of history and maybe might encourage some uh, history majors. For each of you, from, from your own experience and research, What's your favorite underused, underutilized primary source? <sighs> what a fabulous question. Katie, do you have an answer? Oh, my gosh. Or, you know, it doesn't have oh, to no. be the most underutilized, but just, you know, an unexpected primary source that you found to be very um, fruitful or helpful. So I can go first, Katie. I'll let you fill in. Please. <laughs> The Museum of the City of New York has a wonderful digital collection, and I found invaluable in my writing to be uh, postcards of the East Bronx camps that were existent in the early 20th century. People camped in cotton um, tents on East Bronx waterfronts, and I couldn't, they they took them down each summer, so it's hard to find an archive, right, because they they weren't liar long term. But in these postcards, you can learn so much about how people lived their lives in the East Bronx before it was developed in the mid 20th century. And so sometimes they have notes on the back. Um, Katie offers some in our article here about Triborough Bridge. And so that gives kind of social history, right? Regular people send in mail, taking photos, saving them. And there are lots of great collections. I'll say um, something that is related, but maybe a, a little bit tangential to Robert Moses, but something I stumbled upon, found just fun and fascinating to look at, and have also uh, used in class a lot, is the Columbia University's uh, New York real estate brochure collection. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a great collection of, of dozens of, maybe even hundreds, of real estate brochures that date from the 1920s into the 1960s. A lot of them are a mix of uh, neighborhood views, floor plans, and uh, exterior views of apartment buildings. And I think it's an incredible insight into uh, middle-class apartment living in the city. There's a lot of outer borough coverage, which is really great. It can be difficult to find primary sources about middle-class daily life in Queens and Brooklyn and the Bronx. And it's interesting to think about, you know, what were the things that people found enticing? How, How were people attracted to apartment living in the mid 20th century? What amenities were people looking for? I think the outer borough story, uh, you know, needs more telling. And it's a it's a great resource. And it's also something that is 
really legible. It's easy to read, and then you can layer other historical sources onto it. Oh, that's great. Well, hopefully that will spark some interest and get some people thinking about their own research. And thank you for both talking about your research and study and and thoughts on Robert Moses. We appreciate it. And we we appreciate you talking with us tonight. Thank Thank you. Yes, thank you, Katie and Kara, for helping us sort through, think through the issues of Robert Moses, the men, the legacy, the works. You can find links to related resources, including Katie and Kara's two-part essay and some of the books we mentioned and some other readings and sources in our show notes. That's at longislandhistoryproject.org. And if you have any of your own thoughts on Robert Gore, you'd like to share anything about your own experiences studying or researching Long Island history, why don't you get in touch? Send us an email to Long Island History Project at gmail.com. And if you like this episode, if you liked any of our episodes, all we ask is that you share it with a friend. Let them know that there is a podcast out there dedicated to Long Island history. That does it for this episode. Our outro music was Capering by the Blue Dot Sessions, used under an Attribution 4.0 international license. And as always, thank you for listening. <laughs>